Today I'm going to do something a little bit different, a little bit out of the ordinary as far as the sermon's concerned. I've never done one like this, but I want to be your host today as we enjoy a meal together. I suppose you could think of it as a restaurant, and so you can just sit wherever you want. Okay, I see. That's good. Good choice. We're going to enjoy several courses together from God's Word. And then I want you to think about how satisfied you are. These are pictures of some of my favorite foods. That's why I put them there. Those are zipper peas. Not many people around here know what they are, but we actually found them out at the Gateway in Curry, and I love them. And then, of course, fried chicken. You can't preach the word without eating the bird is what I've always heard. And pecan pie. Some home cooking does us good. And with today being Mother's Day, I thought this might be the time to try this. So first of all, I want to ask you what you would like to drink. We have a couple of choices. First of all, you can enjoy a nice glass of the water of life. Jesus said that he offers unto us this water. John chapter 4 and verse 14, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. That sounds good to me. Do you want this? Do you desire the the pure, clean water of life that Jesus offers to us? Nothing can be more satisfying. On days when we've been working hard, laboring, maybe we've been in the yard doing yard work in the hot sun, there is nothing better than a glass of ice cold water. But there is nothing spiritually more satisfying than the life that Jesus Christ offers us. It is pure, it is free from contaminants, it is clear, it is crisp, and it satisfies our souls. You can have water or you have your choice of teas. We have several to choose from. There is first of all trusting God. Proverbs 3 verse 5 Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Certainly this is a sweet tea. It is a tea that if we apply it to our lives, again, will satisfy our thirst, will slake our thirst. Trusting God when we don't know what to do, when we don't know where to turn, it always leads to the right way. It always leads to what is best for us. You can trust God and you can live your life in that trust. He is trustworthy. He will never let us down. You can have trust. You can be a thoughtful person. Philippians 4 verse 8, the book of Philippians being that book that is so full of joy and positivity. And this verse tells us how to think. It tells us how our minds should be focused. The things that should consume our thoughts, not worldliness, not the things that we get caught up in trying to satisfy ourselves, trying to keep our kids busy and happy. But these are the things that if we'll think about them, we will never thirst spiritually. Philippians 4 verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You can satisfy your thirst, your spiritual thirst, by thinking about these things, those things that are true. The way of God is true. His word is true. It can never be wrong. When we think about the things that are honest, upright, sincere, open and out front, nothing to hide, but things that are honest. We talked this morning about propriety, always doing what is appropriate and proper, always doing what is right. When we're thinking about ways to live that way, thinking about good deeds that we can do for others, we're always going to be satisfied in our spirit. You can live your life with trust, thinking about the things that He's asked us to, or we can think about, or, or we can uh, partake of, uh, really the idea is totality, all of our time. Uh, Mark 12 is uh, the record of that great commandment that Jesus records where all four parts of us are included. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's totality. I, I really meant to change that. 
but it's our time as well. When we give ourselves completely to God, we reserve nothing for ourselves, our will has changed, we're going to find this kind of satisfaction. We're going to find that our thirst has been filled. So you have a choice of drinks. Which would you like? Next, we move to our appetizer. You're going to be offered one appetizer and you can choose to partake of it. That appetizer is the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. And you might say, well, that's the center point, isn't it? That's the most important thing that we do. Some seem to worship with this belief. They'll come, partake of the Lord's Supper, and then leave. When the appetizer, the, the, the Lord's Supper really truly is our appetizer. Brother Billy mentioned 1 Corinthians chapter 10 this morning in his presiding over the Lord's table. And I want us to notice verse 16. And, and he referenced the use of that word communion. When we gather around that table, when we partake of these emblems, we are in communion with Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? We're in communion with Christ when we're partaking of these emblems of His body and His blood. That means that we are enjoying this together with Him. He is there, we are in a relationship. But Jesus isn't present here physically with us. He's not here as we partake. He is in heaven preparing a place for us. So the communion that we enjoy and that we declare and that we participate in when we partake of the Lord's Supper is a foretaste of things to come. It is in that sense an appetizer when we will be able to have communion with Him in His presence in eternity in heaven forever. It is simply whetting our appetite or something even greater. And in that sense, it is an appetizer. We are declaring that our lives are lived every day in communion with Him. The idea here, this communion, this fellowship, is a constant state of being. But it is something that looks forward, something that looks ahead, something that is preparing us for an even better communion. So you can have this appetizer, but you must be in a right relationship with Him. We cannot partake of the Lord's Supper unworthily, we must examine ourselves. We must partake of it with the right mind, with the right heart, and with the understanding of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. Now you've got your drink, you've got your appetizer. Let's move on to a choice of entrees. We have two uh, that might meet your needs. You can choose from or you can have a, a little of both, I suppose. We have prepared for you the fatted calf. In Luke chapter 15, we have the parable of the, uh, of the two sons. And really the idea here, the emphasis, is on the forgiving father. When the prodigal son spent his inheritance on riotous living, he realized he had reached the bottom of his existence. He had reached a low point. Many of us can, uh, can relate to him in that sense. But the text then says, as he was there among the swine, among the pigs, that he came to himself. And he said, I'm no longer worthy to be called the son of my father, but I'm going to go back and ask for a position in his household. The servants are taken care of there. I can at least be a servant. And when he returned, Of course, the father welcomed him with open arms. The father ran out to meet him and forgave him and restored him to the position of son. And they killed the fatted calf. The fatted calf here represents God's great forgiveness. All of us stand in need of his forgiveness. All of us have been prodigal, wasteful children in our sins. But when we return to him with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, he forgives He's waiting with open arms arms for us to return. And He has prepared for us the fatted calf. His blessings await. This entree, this meat, represents God's forgiveness. And all of us, when we think about the forgiveness that God has extended us, the things that we've done contrary to His will in our lives, every day our spirits should be full, should be filled with the thought of God's forgiveness. That fatted calf should be more than enough 
for all of us spiritually. But if you're not a fan of red meat, you can also have fish. In Matthew, in Luke chapter 9, this miracle is, is recorded, I believe, in all four gospel accounts. Jesus took a few loaves and a few fishes and fed 5,000 people. Luke chapter 9 here. And what this represents for us is that Jesus and what is revealed about Him, the promises that He has made to us, the way He has changed our lives, the hope that He offers us, He can satisfy every need. Philippians 4.19 tells us exactly that. My God shall supply all your need. And this multiplying fish, this pair of this um, example, that miracle that Jesus performed here for these, for this great multitude of people, proves to us that there's nothing for us spiritually that God cannot do. He can meet every need if we'll trust Him. If we will give Him what we have in our hands, He can use us to bless others. This thought as well should be so satisfying to us. It should fill us every day, knowing that there is not a need that I will face that Jesus cannot meet. He can make what we have multiply in our lives so that then we can bless others as well. So you have a choice of entrees. You might be able to think of others as well, but these were just the ones that came to my mind. Uh, references to meat uh, in, in Scripture. You have a choice between the fatted calf reminding us of God's forgiveness and the multiplying fishes reminding us that Jesus can supply all our needs. But there are side dishes to consider as well. You have a choice here. First of all, you can have salad if you are so inclined. Hebrews chapter 11 is full of salad because it contains several references to let us in a row. In fact, the phrase let us is found 12 times in the book of Hebrews. It is full of salad because this book encourages us together to be moving forward, to grow, to encourage, to help one another, not to look back, not to think about what we're leaving behind, but to progress together. That's the idea here. And we find several in a row here in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. First of all, he reflects upon Jesus Christ. That's our focus. That's what keeps us moving forward. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God. This is who we have. So in consideration of what Jesus is in our lives, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That sounds appetizing to me. A life where we together encourage, exhort one another. We help each other. When we see one falling and struggling, we reach out, we help. Let us together serve as really what we think of as salad. A mixture of all of these different flavors and, and, and colors to make one beautiful and delicious dish. That's who we are as the church. We are a conglomeration of different talents, different abilities, different backgrounds, but we are working together. So let us draw near, let us encourage, let us hold fast, let us provoke one another. Or if you don't like salad, you have a choice of peas that you can uh, partake of, choose as your side. You might choose patience. And I know maybe this is something we, we could all use a dose of from time to time. But here, while we're in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the writer, the speaker here again says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, all of these examples of faith in chapter 11, they're encouraging us as we run our race. 
Seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside, there's let us, every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the brace that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. If we can run this race with patience, with endurance, with a willingness to suffer, no matter what people may say or do against us, our eyes being set on the prize, the goal, Jesus, and His glory. He did it. He suffered. He endured. He demonstrated patience. We can as well. If we look to Him as our example and run this race with endurance, there is that reward. We also will be set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Maybe we all need this as our side dish, a reminder from time to time that we need to run our race with patience. Don't give up. Don't cash in your chips. Don't stop running. Don't stop moving forward. If you stop, then you're moving backwards. You're dying. But if we run with patience, endurance, there is a reward at the end of the line. Patience, prayer, of course, is part of our daily lives. Just before the verse uh, instructing us about what our minds and our hearts, what our thoughts should be set upon. Verse 6 in Philippians chapter 4 says, Be careful or be anxious for nothing. He will supply all our needs. There's nothing that we have to worry about the outcome. It will work together for our good. It may not be what we wanted. It may not be comfortable. It may not be prosperous for us. But we still don't have to worry about our spiritual well-being despite what happens to us. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. While you are feasting on God's blessings and His riches, you're feasting on His forgiveness and His supplication of all your needs, let us remember to thank Him every day for what He has done in our lives. Patience. Prayer, or you could choose peace, peace, peace. It is a peace that passes understanding, as is mentioned there in verse 7. But I want to draw your attention to Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. We often think of this verse and focus on the justification that is ours through Christ. But the emphasis is on the peace that we have. As being justified by the blood of God, blood of Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. We're no longer in conflict with Him. We're not walking and thinking contrary to His will. We're not trying to get Him to see things from our perspective, but we have finally given in to Him. Let His will become ours, and now we're at peace with Him. That's what He offers us, this peace of mind. Because we realize that Jesus Christ has paid the price. He's made up the difference. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God, but this word justification contains the idea that He makes up that difference. He brings us up to the measure by which we will be judged. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this can be ours, but we must be feasting on these things. This is what we're choosing to dine upon in our lives daily. And it's not just a once a week meal that we're engaged in. These are the things that we should be thinking about, we should be consuming daily in our spiritual lives. If we're not, if this is just something we partake in every once in a while, maybe on Sundays when we come together, occasionally on Wednesday nights, we're going hungry. We're starving to death spiritually. These are things that should fill us up every day. So the meal is over. It's time for us to enjoy some sweets, a dessert. You have only, again, one choice of dessert, and that is the fruit of the Spirit. If we're walking in the light, if our will has changed, if we're studying daily those things that have been revealed for us in the Word of God, our faith is increasing, we're growing, we're moving forward, and we're encouraging and exhorting one another, the fruit of the Spirit is going to be present. It's going to abound in our lives. These things don't just happen accidentally, but when we're practicing discipleship to Jesus Christ, when we have changed our identity, where we desire now to be like Him, 
these descriptions just flow out of us. It's almost that we don't even have to try, but they are there naturally. That's the idea here. The works of the flesh are manifest, and those are listed verses 19 through 21, but in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. That's a complete spiritual meal. And it is here for you. It is at your disposal. You can partake of it at every moment. Whenever you're in need, open God's Word. Whenever you feel spiritually hungry, open God's Word. Whenever you need some encouragement and exhortation, open God's Word. Get down on your knees and pray. Call a brother or sister and and ask for help. That's what we're here for. And so now that we've been through this meal together, are you full? Are you satisfied? The way you're living your life day to day, do these things fill you constantly? Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 6, in the Beatitude, Beatitudes, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Why? For they shall be filled. It's a promise. It's a guarantee. Spiritually, in our lives, if we know we're lacking, we know that we're hungry, we know there's something that's just not right, are you feasting? Are you in communion with Jesus Christ? Are you partaking of His bounty every day? I want you to make self-assessment. Are you at the table with Jesus? Or are you sitting off by yourself trying to fill your life on physical prosperity? Trying to fill your life in your own pleasure, in your own pursuits? It's never going to work. Solomon tried it. And he explains that in the book of Ecclesiastes. It was all striving for the wind. It was all vanity. The only way we're going to have that kind of satisfaction, that kind of contentment, we'll be able to rub our bellies and say that was good, is if we're living and abiding within God's Word on a daily basis. You can make your life right this afternoon by being obedient to the Gospel, getting into communion with Him. Put Christ on in baptism after you've repented of your sins You've adopted His will into your life and you'll become a new creature. You'll be in that relationship with Him where you can share in the riches of His grace, the riches of His bounty, the riches of His blessings as described in the book of Ephesians. If you've done that and you recognize, I'm starving to death spiritually. And it's my own choice. It's the things that I'm pursuing. Know there's something better. See what God offers you in His Word, the satisfaction and the contentment. Put that worldliness out of your mind, out of your heart, and let God fill you with what He offers. Spiritual contentment through Jesus Christ, His Son. If you have need to respond to God's invitation, won't you come forward while we stand and sing?